there everybody. For this instalment of the Ice Monster, we're joined by Jess the dog. She is. <laughs> and I'm going to be reading chapters 23 to 27. Chapter 23, The Sticky Fingers Gang. Elsie knew there was no way she could do all this all on her own. So she decided to get some help. Expert help. There was a legendary group of tearaways who were the best pickpockets in the whole of London. If only she could find them. They were named the Sticky Fingers Gang. They were so called because their sticky little fingers would worm their way into the coat pockets of every rich lady and gentleman in London and then worm their way out with things stuck to them. Sometimes it would be nothing more than a half-sucked sweet, a snotty rag or, worst of all, a set of false teeth. However, at other times, their fingers would stick themselves to precious things. Things like pocket watches, gold coins, silver rimmed spectacles, jewels, and of course, silk handkerchiefs. The members of the Sticky Fingers gang were Joseph or Big Joe. The self-appointed leader. He could pick pockets in his sleep. Zoe, the real leader. She had been thieving since, since before she could walk. She was known to readers of the Times, who wrote often about her crimes as the baby-faced baddie. Nellie was better known as Smelly Nellie, as she used her bottom burps to, to distract her victims. Bella, or Little Un, was the shortest of the gang. She could barely reach the pockets of the rich ladies and gentlemen of London, so carried a stool around with her to help. Lottie was the baddest of the lot. Pickpocketing was just one of her many crimes. She was wanted by police forces all over England for duffing up a strong man, doing a cheesy burp in the face of a nun, and force feeding cheese to a nun. Grace, or Dangerous Grace, was the toughest member of the gang. Nobody but nobody crossed Grace, unless they wanted a wedgie, a Chinese burn or a knuckle sandwich. George, or Guiltless George, looked innocent, but he was anything but. George disguised himself as a choir boy, which meant he could get away with absolute murder. Light-fingered Freya could steal for England. One day at the fairground, she stole 318 silk handkerchiefs, a barrel of sugar plums and a carousel. Asia and Athena were sisters and partners in crime. When they weren't warring with each other, they oversaw a criminal empire that included gambling, extortion and bare-knuckle boxing. They were known as the Sisters of No Mercy. Two more sisters rounded off the gang, Senea and Rihanna, the gruesome twosome. The pair worked as a team. Senea would pose as a sweet flower seller as her little sister Rihanna came round the back and robbed you blind. The Sticky Fingers gang were legendary figures on the streets of London. Rumours of their exploits swirled across the city but nobody had a clue where to find them, except Elsie. Chapter 24. Handprints. Elsie had noticed that all over London there were small red handprints on walls and buildings. Once, in the dead of night, she had seen Dangerous Grace put one on the side of St Paul's Cathedral. Elsie was sure it was some kind of secret sign some way that the gang communicated with one another. So Elsie had followed Grace as she added more red handprints to the door of 10 Downing Street and even Westminster Abbey. 
The handprints looked like arrows pointing somewhere. So the night the professor sent Elsie out on her mission, she followed the trail all the way to the Houses of Parliament. The last one she found was on the clock tower of Big Ben. It pointed upwards. Surely this couldn't mean that the Sticky Fingers Gang's secret hideout was up there. There was only one way to find out. Elsie forced open a tiny door at the base and climbed up the, the staircase to the very top of the tower. Hello, called out Elsie as she stepped into the room, the huge clock face looming behind her like a full moon. Bong! bonged Big Ben. Is there anyone there? asked Elsie. The girl could swear she heard scuttling. Maybe it was a rat. Maybe it wasn't. Hello, I'm looking for the sticky fingers. Before she could utter the word gang, a cloth bag was thrown over her head. Help! she screamed. Bong! Shut your face! hissed an unseen voice. Elsie was hurled into a corner and she took the bag off her head. Bong! A number of children appeared from the shadows. What the stink are you doing here? demanded Big Joe. Bong! Zoe pushed him aside. What are you doing here, little mite? If you want to join our gang, you better think again. Bong! The two sisters, Sonea and Rihanna, pulled Elsie to her feet, then began playing catch with her as if she were a ball. Think you're tough enough, do you? said the elder one. You couldn't punch your way out of a paper bag, added the younger one. Bong! Suddenly a shove came from behind. Elsie turned around. It was Grace. The girl yanked Elsie's ear. Ow! Cry, baby, snorted Grace. Bong! George, dressed in his choir boy disguise, stepped forward, wielding a hymn book. Bonk! He bashed it down on the girl's head. Ow! Whoops, he chuckled. I dropped my hymn book. Bong! Now it was Bella's turn. The little girl marched forward and plonked her stool down in front of Elsie. She climbed on it and then poked Elsie in the eye. Plonk. Ah! Bong! You ain't seen nothing, right? Or if you like, I can do the other eye. No, no, please, pleaded Elsie. Bong! Then Asia and Athena took their turn, using the girl as a punch bag. She's about as tough as a plate of jelly. She'll be jelly when we've finished with her. Bong! Finally, Nellie stepped forward. She wore heavy boots, far too big for her, and stamped on the little girl's toes. Donk! Ah! Bong! Not so tough now, are you? sneered Nellie. Why don't you go running back to Mummy? Elsie took a deep breath and gathered her thoughts. Because like you, I ain't got no mummy. And please, I need you to help someone, or rather something, that doesn't have one neither. Something? asked Zoe. The Sticky Fingers gang all leaned forward. Elsie grinned from ear to ear. She had them hooked. Chapter 25. Pickpocketing on Ice This was the best bedtime story ever! Up in the clock tower of Big Ben, Elsie told the gang of child thieves the whole tale. Just as with all the orphans at Wormley Hall, the girl had the entire audience enthralled with her storytelling. She told them how the mammoth had been found, about Queen Victoria's visit, and how the plan was, go was to bring it back to life with a bolt of lightning. Let me get this straight, began Big Joe. 
you need us to help you steal 1,000 silk handkerchiefs? Elsie nodded her head. Well, began Zoe, that should all be all in a day's work for the Sticky Fingers gang. Indeed it was, and for Elsie, the most fun day ever. London had become so cold that winter that the River Thames had frozen over. Ladies and gentlemen had put on their skates and were spinning across the ice. The perfect setting for a ballet of pickpocketing. Elsie became part of the most infamous child gang in London for the day as they swooped and swirled and robbed. Ding! A silk handkerchief. And another. Ding! And another and another and another. Ding! A toffee apple. Yum! Ding! A box of toenail clippings. Not so yum. Ding! A silk handkerchief. Ding! Another. Ding! A pair of ladies' bloomers. What were they doing in a bishop's pocket? Ding! A scotch egg. Ding! A silk handkerchief. Ding! Another. Ding! A glove. Ding! A flask of brandy. Ding! A silk handkerchief. The day went like a dream. When two policemen made their way across the ice, Elsie assumed that the fun might be over. Far from it. The Sticky Fingers gang were such skilled thieves, they simply stole from the policemen too. Ding! A cheese and pickle sandwich. Ding! A pair of handcuffs. After a long and surprisingly tiring day of robbing, the gang and Elsie retired to the clock tower to share out the spoils. I've lost count of how many kerchiefs we've got, said Zoe, but there must be over a thousand here. The rest of the loot will give to the poor. Yeah, us, snorted George. All the gang laughed. As for Elsie, her eyes lit up with joy. With the help of her new friends, she had achieved the impossible. Now she could return to the Natural History Museum in triumph. Good luck, kid, said Bella. It was strange being called kid by someone considerably smaller than you, but Bella was a feisty one and so Elsie let it pass. Goodbye, said Elsie as she threw the haul of handkerchiefs over her shoulder and hurried out of the clock tower as the bell chimed eight times. Bong, 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 bong. The girl had done it. Chapter 26. A Little Problem Elsie took the thousand silk handkerchiefs and one pair of ladies' bloomers to the professor. Immediately he put her and Dottie to work, sewing them all together to make some that resembled a balloon. The other bits and pieces the professor asked for were gathered together and by the end of the week the unlikely trio were ready. As storm clouds gathered over London the professor decided that tonight was the night to take to the skies. Now was the moment to see if a prehistoric creature that had been dead for 10,000 years really could be brought back to life. But before all that, there was the little problem of Mr. Clout. The security guard patrolled the Natural History Museum at night and, although he wasn't the brightest spark, there was every chance he would notice a live mammoth. Click, clack, click, clack, click, clack. You could hear him coming a mile off in those hobnail boots of his. Good evening, Mr. Clout, sir said Dotty, as she pretended to mop the corridor. Why are you still here? asked the security guard. He took pleasure in treading all over the clean part of the floor, so poor Dotty would have to do it all again. It was way past closing time at the museum, and Clout was used to having the place to himself. Dotty should have been long gone by now. Yes, Mr Clout, sir, and behold, there is a very stubborn stain on the ceiling. The ceiling? Yes. 
Or would there be a stain on the ceiling? Uh, maybe someone spilled their tea and it went upwards. Upwards? It can happen. Cloud peered up. Well, I can't see anything. Keep looking, urged Dotty. This was Elsie's cue. Unseen by Clout, she crawled between his legs and began untying his long boot laces. Dotty stole glances at the girl to check her progress. There is no stain, said the man. Keep looking. Then Elsie began tying his boots together. I think you have finally lost your marbles, madam. Keep looking! Elsie nodded to Dotty. That was her cue. The cleaning lady whisked up her bucket and slammed it down over Clout's head. Clang! The man couldn't see a thing. Who turned the lights out? As his boots were tied together, he couldn't get away. Quick! shouted Elsie, and together she and Dotty bundled him into the cleaning cupboard. Get off me! They slammed the door, donk, and locked it. Click! Boom, boom, boom! Clout thumped on the door. Let me out! Outside the door, the pair giggled like naughty school children. <laughs> right, said Elsie. Let's get to work. Chapter 27 Thunder Snow. Standing on top of one of the Natural History Museum's towers, Elsie ordered Dotty to listen. After a few moments, the lady became restless and asked, What are we listening for? Silence, replied the girl. It's quite hard to hear that. Shh, chided Elsie. Listen, the birds in the trees have gone quiet. You're right, replied Dotty. Above their heads, black clouds rolled across the sky. It feels too cold to rain, said the lady. It's not going to rain, it's going to snow. Thunder snow. You get to know this stuff when you don't have a roof over your head. Thunder snow? It sounds very dramatic. Do you think it's safe to be all the way up here during a thunder snow? No. I thought as much. Oh well, if anything happens to me, please tell Titch I love him. Oh yes, Titch. You'll find him at the Royal Hospital. He lent us this tin helmet. Oh yes, I thought it was tiny. Good things come in small packages. Now, I want to leave all my earthly goods, my mops, my brushes and my bucket to you, Elsie. That's very kind. I'm touched, Dotty, truly. But if I get a job as a cleaning lady in heaven, I'll need them back. Understood? Yes, you can have them back any time you want them, either in this world or the next. Now, let's get this fire going. They turned their attention to their homemade hot air balloon, which they had assembled by following the professor's instructions. After a few attempts, they got the wood in the drum burning. Hot air began to rise. Slowly, the balloon of handkerchiefs and one pair of bloomers began to inflate. Miraculously, the stitches held firm. The multicoloured globe grew and grew until it looked big enough to take Dotty's not inconsiderable weight. Elsie turned to Dotty. Now, when I tug on the copper wire three times, that means the other end is stuck right in the mammoth's heart. The mammoths? Yes. There wasn't time... The mammoths? Yes. There wasn't time to correct her, so Elsie ploughed on. Then, and only then, should you launch the balloon into the air. Understand? Yes, three times, Dotty nodded. Boom! Thunder echoed across the sky. To the side of the tower was a narrow chimney pipe. It wasn't much wider than a dinner plate. Elsie breathed out all the air she had inside her and lowered herself feet first down the chimney. See you at the bottom, she called up. Are 
aren't you forgetting something? asked Dotty. Elsie looked up at the lady, confused. The wire? Oh, yes, that would be useful, said Elsie. Oh, you're as daft as I am, chuckled Dotty. She held out the end of the wire and Elsie placed it in her mouth before disappearing down into the darkness. The girl's hands and feet frantically searched the sides for nooks and crevices to hold on to. Eventually she could see a tiny square of light beneath her. It was the fireplace that opened into the museum director's office. Squawk! Ah! screamed the girl. Something was attacking her. Feathers, a beak, talons. A bird! It must have been nesting in the chimney stack. The creature seemed as frightened as she was. Both were flailing around in a desperate attempt to survive. In all the commotion, Elsie began sliding down at speed. Ah! She cried. And next time we'll read from chapter 28. Bye bye!